Chapter 40. Before we even got close to the stage of being trained in all the skills of special of a special forces soldier, we would have to pass the hill phase of the selection. This was simply the SAS's way of whittling down the numbers from the masses to the few. It was always against the clock and invariably against the elements. Only when the few remained would the SAS begin to teach and train those recruits in the real special forces skills. Such training is very time and money intensive for the regiment and there was no point spending such valuable resources on people who didn't, underst- un- un- who didn't underneath it all have the right attitude and required fitness. So phase one was to whittle, phase two was to train. We had lost almost a quarter of the recruits from our squadron already since starting pre-selection. And we're now officially about to start selection proper. In the squadron barracks, we were escorted into the main campus area where all the bulk of the squadron buildings were. We were no longer just confined to a side block and the gymnasium. This was at least progress. We were briefed on what would be expected of us from now onwards and then kitted out with our first military fatigues and basic equipment. We were then shown our recruit locker room, lined with metal mesh lockers and red painted concrete floor. This was to be our home for as long as we lasted on the course. The message they kept drumming into us was clear. If you want it bad enough, you'll pass. This whole first hill phase of selection would be carried out in the wild Welsh peaks of the Brecon Beacons. For the next six months, the bulk of my time was to be spent spent sweating and slogging around these mountains, sometimes in soaring heat and blazing sun, surrounded by plagues of mosquitoes and drenched in sweat, then later on in the year, ploughing through thick, deep snow, cold and wet, and at times being nearly blown over by the force of the wind on the high peaks. At times, we would be carrying up to £75 in total, roughly the weight of an average eight-year-old kid. Both hypothermia and exhaustion were going to become the ever-present enemy, along with the time clock. It's a constant battle as your boots fill with water and your clothing turns stiff in the gale force wind that sweeps across the Welsh mountains. Can you keep moving and fast? The whole selection process is about so much more than just physical fitness. It requires navigational skills, mental agility, self-discipline and a fierce determination to push on when your legs and whole body are screaming to rest. The SAS can afford to be tough on recruiting. There'll always be more people willing to test themselves by trying for the regiment. Our first exercise in the Brecon Beacons was what they called a guided tour. It sounded worryingly mundane. We were to be escorted in small groups around the mountains to show, practically, that we had a good grasp on the fine art of the day and night mountain navigation. Only then could they let us loose on our own. As we climbed higher into the mountains, the DS gave us their advice and tips learnt the hard way. Advice on how to navigate effectively and how to cover ground efficiently. I absorbed it all. We took it in turns to navigate each leg and we burnt up the miles. About 10 hours later, we had covered roughly 18 miles up and down the remote valleys and peaks. Everyone was feeling the weight on their backs and our feet were aching, but we were working hard and together and it felt good. We also got our first taste of one particularly high Welsh mountain that we get to know intimately. A peak synonymous with SAS selection and known to all recruits so well. Finally, we stopped in some woods and rested for two hours at the foot of this mountain. I was wet through from the all-day drizzle and sweat, but I was excited. We awaited darkness. The next stage would be the first of many night navigation exercises. Chapter 41. As night fell, we headed off in small groups into the darkness in search of the first checkpoint, or RV, rendezvous. Moving at night through the high mountain terrain was hard and we were soon all fumbling around, stumbling into ditches and unseen bogs. Night navigation is an art that we were soon to become experts in, but as of yet our feet, eyes and instincts were new and uncertain. I noticed though that the DS who were with us would never trip or stumble. It was only the recruits who would be tripping over clumps of grass or potholes in the dark. It was as if the fully badged SAS guys had learnt this game long ago. I so wanted to to develop that level of confidence and skill and I knew it would come with practice and practice at at moving at night was something we would have no shortage of. We finally traipsed into the last checkpoint in the mountainous forest. Tired, wet and exhausted, 
I tied my poncho between two trees, laid out my bivy bag and fell fast asleep. Two hours later, at 05.55, we were lined up along the track leading up to one of the high peaks, some six miles away. Standing high above us, the summit was barely visible in the early morning half-light. Looking down the ragged line of recruits to my left, I could see that everyone was buttoned up against the chill. Army green woolen hats, damp combat, damp combat clothes, hands clasped in fists at our sides trying to keep warm, and packs neatly laid in front of us on the ground. Each soldier's breath was steaming in the cold air. My feet were sore and felt tight in my new army boots. I could feel that they had started to swell with bruising, with a bruising. The RSM, the regimental sergeant major, shouted out, stick with me if you want to pass this course. Then he was offered a pace. We raced off after him, hauling our packs on as we moved. Recruits were fighting to barge past each other in an attempt to get to the front. But keeping up with this pace meant going almost at, f- at a full run, a task that I knew would be impossible to maintain. Each step up was hard fought, and as the gradient increased, I could feel my energy draining. My body was running on reserves. I was already pouring with sweat and sucking for air. This is where it counts. This is the time to shine. I kept telling myself, do not slip back, even one step. I knew that to slip back would be fatal. I would be swallowed by the other recruits and would never be able to keep the pace. It was the energy of this front pack that was keeping me there, despite the punishing pace and gradient. I found myself amongst the few who had managed to keep up with the RSM by the time we reached the summit, and I fought hard to maintain that position all the way down the other side, running all the way down the steep mountain paths. By the time we reached the bottom, we were a good 20 minutes ahead of most of the struggle of recruits. When the whole great group were assembled, the officer announced that our performance had been an embarrassment, and that if we were serious about passing, we'd all have to start putting some effort in. With that comment, he told us to stay where we were. He then ordered the trucks to start up and we watched as they all pulled away, driving off down the main road empty. Turn around, lads. The trucks will be waiting for you back on the other side. That took you a pathetic two hours, 17 minutes to complete. You all now have two hours to retrace your steps back over the mountain to make the trucks. Those outside at the time have failed and will walk home. Bleary-eyed, I turned to start the climb again. I pushed to the front of the group, determined to make a good start and keep ahead and headed back up the mountain as we cleared the first false horizon some 20 minutes later a corporal was stood there waiting noting silently who was up front and who had dropped behind already he quietly pointed down back down the steep slope get back down lads the truck's coming back good to see you was pre- who was prepared to put in the effort though he said nodding at the front runners which included trucker and myself we turned and started down exhausted and drained We all collapsed silently at the back of the four tonne lorries and heaved a sigh of relief as the engine started up and we pulled out onto the road and headed south. It had just been another little tester, a tester with a purpose. Are you the sort of person who can turn around when you have nothing left and find that little bit extra inside you to keep going? Or do you sag and wilt with exhaustion? It's a mental game and it's hard to tell how people will react until they are squeezed. All I cared about though was that weekend One of the selection, I was done, and the squeezing had begun. Chapter 42 How on earth could lying on the metal floor of an army truck, crammed, exhausted and inhaling diesel fumes, be the best feeling on earth, but somehow such moments curled up in our bivvy bags, having survived and passed another weekend exercise, made all the effort and pain worthwhile. The weekly drill nights kept the same momentum running, or PT, or physical training, which consisted of log, long log runs, gruelling strength, strength circuits, fireman's lifts and general beastings, map reading lessons, medic training and weapon handling. As the new recruits, we dressed in green, standard army uniform. You couldn't help but notice the confident, purposeful air that the SAS fully bad sh- soldiers wandering around camp possessed. In contrast, us recruits knew nothing and we were nothing. We were just numbers, nothing more, nothing less. I looked with hidden admiration at the carefully moulded berets and winged daggered belts that the SAS guys wore. I was also beginning to appreciate the work that had gone in to earn them. Our next selection weekend in the mountain was soon looming over me again. No sooner had my body begun to recover from one test than the fear and the stress of what was to come next was upon me again. I mean, no one looks forward to being driven physically to their knees over and over again. 
The four-ton green army truck pulled into a quiet lay-by at the foot of another cold, wind-swept mountain. At about 1am, it was raining hard. In pairs, we tried to find a small patch of flat ground to sleep. But sleep was impossible, and tucked into the side of a gully, in what was fast becoming a soaking wet bog, we made what we could of the, of the five hours until dawn. At 5.55am we were all stood to attention in the marsh in the pouring rain. The SAF officer in charge told us that this was our last accompanied set of marches, and to remember the importance of learning key lessons from the DS with us. He handed over to the corporals, and then turned and walked away. No sooner was the briefing over, over than the DS just turned and shouted at us to follow them. They stormed ahead across the steep, marshy moon grass, and within minutes they were they were what seemed like miles ahead of us. They all stopped and waited, looking back as if as we slowly reached them in a heaving gaggle spread out across the bogland. We were all wet and looking like an utter shambles heaving along under the weight of our packs. In contrast, the DS looked crisp, fit and composed. They were never loud or aggressive. They were just indifferent and they had been fast, very fast. I had no idea how they had managed to cover almost a mile of steep boggy ground in so little time and look so unaffected. They calmly told us that this was the sort of pace we would need to be doing as a minimum speed later during selection. I tried not to think about that, but just told myself to keep up with them at all cost. It was obvious that the gulf between a recruit and a badged SAS officer was vast. We started moving again, and soon I began to feel stronger as I got into my rhythm. Under the DS's guidance, we practised crossing swollen streams with full kit, as well as carefully getting the feel of traversing the steep and exposed mountain faces with the weight of, of pack, webbing and rifle. At 1.30pm, we had a short break to take on food and water, and we sat huddled in a group in a small gully. But the stop didn't last long, and soon we set off again for the next leg of the march, the final 15 miles of the day. As we headed up the next peak, I noticed all the other recruits alongside me, heads down, straining with sweat pouring off their foreheads. No one spoke. We were all just bust busting our backsides to keep up the pace. The last few miles along the ridge and down the other side of the mountain dragged on until we finally reached the day march's end. We were told to rest up for an hour in the woods, check our feet and take on board some food and water. But this rest was made truly miserable by the swarms of summer midges that enveloped each of us. I had never known them so thick in the air. The army mosquito repellent was utterly useless against them and all it did was give the midges something to stick to, leaving you to wipe off swarms of them with your hands. All we wanted now was to get marching again and get the wind through our hair and the midges off our backs. We were soon lined up again on parade in the woods and told stand still and do not move. The air was so thick with midges that each breath you took you inhaled a mouth of the, mouthful of the brutes. All you wanted to do was to scratch and brush them away from your face and standing there immobile enveloped in the swarms was truly hellish. Stop moving! shouted one of the DS who we had unofficially named Mr Nasty. He then proceeded to stand in front of us covered in the midges as well and watch us waiting for one of us to quit. I kept blinking my eyes and twitching my nose in a futile attempt to turn the midges that circled relentlessly around our heads. It felt like some old form of tort medieval torture and the seconds went by like hours. It was morale sapping and miserable, but eventually, after about 45 minutes of this head messing, we were stood down to await orders for the night march. It had been a simple reminder that mental strength was something that had to accompany the physical, and the physical is always driven by the mental. And it was a lesson that every one of us on that godforsaken midge-infested forest track was taught that day. Chapter 43. The DS came forward and told us that the night's march ahead would be an educational introduction to the infamous moon grass. This consisted of bog land riddled with mile upon mile of tufts of clumpy grass and ankle twisting divots that made any sort of progress on this impossible. Over the following months, we would learn to dread and hate this moon grass, or baby heads as many of the recruits called it, as it resembled millions of small heads sticking out of the ground. That night I expected the worst and I wasn't disappointed. Wading across mile after mile of these melon-sized clumps of weed tussocks was hellish. It was made worse by the fact that in the darkness, each step you placed was a lottery as to whether you tripped or not. Add to this the fact that much of the moon grass also had razor-sharp, chest-high um, reeds growing out of it, 
and you can see why all the soldiers learn to hate it so much. In the pitch black, my legs buckled and twisted on each step and occasionally I'd slip up to my thighs in stinking black oozy mud. Finally, as we came off the high plateau, we arrived at the perimeter fence, the perimeter fence of a farm beneath us. We were warned to stay silent. The farmer had been known to chase lads on selection off his land with a shotgun. This all added to the excitement as we skirted cautiously around his house and over the fence. After a final fast and furious speed march along the forestry tracks in the dark, we reached our destination at about 3am. Three hours of precious rest lay ahead of us now, but huddled in the woods. These times of sleepless, wet, cold waiting um, constituted some of the worst parts of selection for me. Physically, your body was in bits, your knees and the soles of your feet would be swollen and stiff and your body would be crying out for decent rest. But we rarely got more than three hours in between marches and it was neither long enough to rest nor short enough to stay fired up on that exercise high. Instead, you would just get cold and stiff and even more sleep deprived and exhausted. It was a killer combination. The SAS directing staff knew this. The self-will needed to get back up time and time again to keep slogging over the mountains in the dark while being soaking wet and cold was just what they were looking for. In those few hours reprieve, I would busy myself sorting out my blistered feet, eating some food and heating up a hot drink. But after that was done, I could only lie there waiting, waiting for that dreaded call to muster on parade for the morning battle PT. Each weekend, this battle PT got more and more unpleasant and harder and harder. The next morning in full kit, kit we paraded in the pre-dawn night. Everyone was shuffling around with stiff, aching legs and we all looked drained and exhausted. In contrast, the instructors were pacing around, hungry for blood. And then at 0555 on the dot, the order went out. Follow us and keep up. This weekend, your performance has been appalling and now you will pay. The DS set off at a pace down one of the forestry tracks and we pulled on our packs and set out after them. Then the pace quickened to a level when we had to run to keep up, but running under so much weight was near impossible. Within 20 minutes, each of us was gasping and pouring with sweat as we fought to keep up. An hour and a half later, that pace hadn't eased up one notch. We had become this long straggle of moaning, exhausted bodies, dishevelled and in no order, with about a mile between the front and the last man. It was now broad daylight, and each and every man was dead on their feet. I dragged myself along the final track and finished somewhere in the middle of the group, but I was completely spent. I had nothing more I could give. Nothing. If you had asked me to walk another 50 yards, I would have struggled to manage it. As I stood there, my sweat-drenched body steaming, one of the recruits started cursing and muttering quietly to himself. I've had enough of this shit, he grumbled under his breath. It's bollocks. This isn't soldiering, it's sadism. And then he looked at me. No one should be made to do this, he continued. We're treated like pack mules, and even pack mules would eventually die under this workload. I told him to hang on in there, and that he would have forgotten all about this by the end of the day when he was in a warm shower. He then just turned and, st- he then turned and just stared at me. You know the difference between you and me, Bear? You're just dumber than, than me. And with that, he turned, dropped his pack in a heap, walked over to the DS and said he wanted out. The DS quietly directed the guy towards the trucks. The recruit climbed aboard one and I never saw him again. That was, that was how it always happened. They beat you down by quietly raising the bar ever higher and higher until you either snapped or you failed to make the time. And as they always told us, we don't fail you, you fail yourself. If you beat the clock and keep going, you will pass. On the journey back, sat huddled in the four-tonner, I thought about what a recruiter had said. You're just dumber than me. Maybe he had a point. I mean, getting thrashed senseless did feel pretty dumb. And then getting paid only £27 a day for the privilege of being thrashed felt even dumber. But that guy who quit also missed the real point. Good things come through grit and hard work and all things worthwhile have a cost. In the case of the SAS, the cost was somewhere around a thousand barrels of sweat. Was it a price I was prepared to pay? It was a question that selection would give me plenty of time to ask myself.